We will meet when the danger is over. We will meet when the sad days are done. We will meet sitting closely together and be glad our tomorrow has come. We will join to give thanks and sing gladly. We will join to break bread and share wine. And the peace that we pass to each other will be more than a casual song. This reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. I read. Anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is my disciple. Truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. So what advantage did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's make with each other a promise that when all we've come through is behind, we will share what we in the things that once troubled our mind. Until then, may we always discover faith and love to determine our way. That's our hope and God's will and our Like so many I speak to, I often feel overwhelmed by the changes we've had to face in the last few months. But I wanted in this sermon to reflect on the possibility of hope, or perhaps the insanity of hope. God's hope is not a false hope, not a vain hope, not a Pollyanna everything is going to be okay hope, because everything is not going to be okay. Not for a very long time. Yet hope, as the prophet Jeremiah knew, always bubbles up under even the worst of circumstances. Hope points us to the promised land. And make no mistake, circumstances today are dire. Pope Francis recently commented that we are not living through an era of change, but a change of era. We are entering a new chapter in the history of the world. Leading scientists and climatologists are warning that the collapse of our civilization is the most likely outcome of the present trajectory. Professors are warning that this collapse will appear as an overall deterioration in many features of life, with regional collapses occurring here and there. Professor Hans Joachim Schellenhuber, a former lead author with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has said there is a very big risk that we will just end our civilization. The human species will survive somehow, yes, but we will destroy almost everything we have built up over the last 2,000 years. So then, how do we speak of hope in the face of such an apocalyptic future? COVID-19 has shone a powerful light onto the insanity of our lives, of business as usual, 
We are rightly outraged by governments that have chosen to save the economy rather than saving lives. Governments that are so very quick to offer up the lives of old people and people of color as an acceptable sacrifice to that ancient and insatiable god of the markets that Jesus calls Mammon. Historians tell us that we have been living in the era of globalization. Globalization has worked well for the privileged among us. It is underpinned by a legal framework that upholds the priority of individuals and property rights. Things like place, democracy, tradition, faith, and even community have faded. Globalization is structured upon a predatory capitalist economic system. It harnesses the latest technology. It amasses enormous wealth. It takes over our mainstream media. It captures elected politicians and bribes them or forces them to shunt aside barriers to trade. They are not allowed to let small annoyances like animal welfare, food standards or environmental protections to stand in the way of increased profits. The internet, global corporations, governments and media all combine with frictionless trade in an increasingly integrated global economy. Indeed, globalization has always been rooted in the dominance of big money, big corporations, military, class, race and gender hierarchies designed to strip mine the commons and people and earth in search of profits and power. How do we speak of hope in the face of globalization? As I record the sermon, thousands across the world are taking to the streets to protest the state-sanctioned murder of George Floyd. Statues of slave traders are coming down. The nation faces its largest public health crisis in generations. We have the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Professor Cornell West calls the West a predatory capitalist civilization obsessed with money, money, money. He also makes the connection between the West's violence abroad and at home. But if coronavirus has done anything, it has shone a revealing light onto the self-aggrandizing propaganda spun by the forces of globalization. It has shown its utter contempt and disregard for ordinary people at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Farm workers, hospital porters and nurses are clearly needed, more needed than the billionaires like Richard Branson, but so easily discarded once the emergency subsides. Private healthcare has been shown to be utterly useless and immoral as it excludes the poor from its benefits. In September last year, I was blessed to be part of the United Reformed Church's educational visit to Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. We were mortified at what we saw, the blatant and systematic oppression of the Palestinian people. Israel combines a massive arsenal of physical weapons that is brought to bear against any sign of resistance to the occupation, not unlike the nationalist government of South Africa during apartheid. But in addition, Israel brings its most powerful weapon, that is the nuclear power that resides in a relentless explosion of anti-Semitism accusations that are directed towards any person, any country or any church who deviates from its official Zionist party line. One of the indigenous Christians we met on a trip was the Reverend Dr. Munta Isaac, who asks this question. Is shrugging the shoulders, sighing deep and looking worried the only reaction to be expected from sympathetic churches outside of Palestine and Israel? Let us be clear, he says. Implementing the Trump plan would bring catastrophic consequences for the prospect of a political solution between Israelis and Palestinians. But Trump's plan transforms the Holy Land into a Zionist fairyland for the enjoyment of extreme Christian evangelicals while the local Christian population remains subjugated under Israel's coercion." End quote. How are we to speak hope into what appears to be a hopeless situation in the Holy Land? Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu famously stated, when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible, we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. And when we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. That is a true word spoken in jest, but corresponds with the experience of many indigenous people and nations in the world, not only in the era of European colonialism, but to this day. So my question, where is hope? If we want real hope, we will need to come out of denial. 
We must face reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. We must trust that God's plan for the coming kingdom will not and cannot be thwarted by human ineptitude. We must let go of the fantasy that tomorrow will look more or less like today, that our children and grandchildren will lead lives more or less that look like ours. And for that, we must be grateful. No longer will they, like us, be devastating the planet through the, the insanity of their lifestyles. No longer will they live in a world where 60 white men have more wealth than the bottom 50% of humanity. If you listen to the soft breeze through the trees, you might hear the sound of a new heaven and a new earth being born. I like to invite people who think that we are going to face enormous losses, like cars and TVs and mobile phones, to imagine what they are going to gain. More community, more food, more love, more leisure time, more wildlife, more forests, and more time for a closer walk with God. What we will lose are insane work hours, the pressure to conform to this world's standards, only seeing our children for a few hours in the week, working so long and hard for measly paychecks that all too quickly disappear into the pockets of the wealthy. We will lose nothing but our chains that enslave us to this crazy system. But for hope to become reality, Jesus showed us the necessity to work and pray for justice, to confront the powers and principalities of this world. We need to tear down the statues of class and race and wealth and power that these idols that prop up the system of domination, slavery and death. But the new world will not be birthed without travail and pain. Jesus sounds a word of warning today's reading to all of his disciples who choose to confront the powers and principalities. We must be ready to receive the reward of the prophet. And the reward of the prophet as Jesus so clearly demonstrated, will probably be the cross of martyrdom. But hope, true hope, is never in flesh and blood. Hope, true hope, is not in the things that we see. Hope, true hope, is in the promise of God. Our hope is in Christ and Him crucified. In hope then, this day, and always, let us proceed with fortitude, wisdom and courage. Let us proceed and walk boldly towards the promised kingdom of love. Amen. As members together of the body of Christ, we pray to Almighty God in the power of the Spirit, bringing our concerns for the church and the world. God, our refuge and strength, Chip away from your church all the built-up layers of complacency and despondency, of over-comfortable familiarity and underactive expectation, of trust in history and tradition. Blow the wind of your spirit through the church, releasing a desire to follow your will and way, to welcome, share, Inspire and offer hope to all with whom we have contact, witnessing to your love, mercy and grace. God of creation, we pray for this planet you crafted, with its delicate balance of ecosystems, teeming life and diversity, accepting our responsibility for its care and preservation. Help us to stand up against the plunder of resources, annihilation of habitats and destruction of wildlife, to act against pollution of water, air and earth, to be agents of hope and wholeness, that the goodness of the earth may be safely and wisely distributed without waste or harm. God of wisdom, we pray for those in authority, for areas of the world torn apart by hatred and violence, famine and disease, discrimination, racism and intolerance. We pray for the miracle of your love to soften hearts, guide decisions 
and help to create a humane and caring world. We pray for the victims of COVID-19 and their families throughout the world. For the scientists and researchers, health and care workers striving to eradicate the disease. For a just and equal sharing of expertise and relief. God of love, we pray for the communities of our local area group, for those we know and care for, those we fear and avoid, especially those who look, behave and think differently to us. We pray for your redirection of those expressing antisocial, addictive or criminal behaviour and your comfort for the lonely vulnerable and marginalised in our society. Remind us that these were the people Jesus sought out. These are the ones you call us to serve. Strengthen us for the task, we pray. God of tenderness, dwell in our homes through these times of anxiety and uncertainty where jobs are insecure, schooling is disrupted, relationships become strained and loved ones are kept apart. In heartache and loss, be our hope and consolation. In the gift of unexpected time to read, think and pray, be our centre and give us peace. In our joys and in our sorrows, teach us to show one another the love you show to us. God of wholeness, speak into the despair and suffering of those we know to be sick or in pain, those whose diagnosis or treatment has been delayed owing to the pandemic, those whose mental health is deteriorating and those silently suffering abuse. Reassure, affirm and meet them in their need, we pray, alerting us to ways we can help. God of peace, be with the dying and as you welcome those who have died in faith into the full life of your kingdom, we too remember them with thankfulness and love. God, our hope and our salvation, we put our trust in you and offer all these prayers in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.